Well, good Wednesday evening to you. Glad you are uh, checking out this wrap-up of the book of Ecclesiastes. We've been studying for uh, several sessions now in our overall look at the wisdom books, our quest for wisdom, we've called it. Um, but this is going to be the last one, I believe, on um, this strange book called Ecclesiastes. Uh, I want to begin, um, hold on a sec. I want to begin with a uh, little bit of a reading from the beginning of a commentary on Ecclesiastes that came out a few years ago. And um, I, I just thought it was a good summary, good way to start as we're thinking about this book and how to how to interpret it and understand it. Um, first couple of paragraphs of this commentary um, say, Douglas Copeland, who popularized the expression Generation X, we've all heard of Generation X, I think we're up to Z now or something like that, but he popularized that expression. He shares in his 1994 publication called Life After God, how life is without how life is without religion or belief. At the end of this autobiographical search, he writes, quote, Now here is my secret. I tell it to you with an openness of heart that I doubt I shall ever achieve again. So I pray that you are in a quiet room as you hear these words. My secret is that I need God that I am sick and can no longer make it alone. I need God to help me give because I no longer seem to be capable of giving. To help me be kind as I no longer seem capable of kindness. To help me love as I seem beyond being able to love. End of quote. And then the writer says, Copeland's search for meaning leads him to God. His book is a timely message for a modern or postmodern generation seemingly beyond God. The book of Ecclesiastes traces an ancient man's quest for meaning. That quest, too, ended with God. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Of course, that's from chapter 12, verse 13 of Ecclesiastes. But that uh, more modern expression of the attitude of uh, the writer of Ecclesiastes, I think, is interesting. Um, and so what I want us to do this evening is just, um, I guess make a few reflections, I call them theological reflections on this book. What are some things sort of in summary that we can say about it to help us understand it and appreciate it? Um, so I'm just going to make a list of those and uh, then maybe make a couple of New Testament connections for you uh, that we find with the book. So first of all, um, remember that Ecclesiastes is a look at the emptiness or vanity of life without a practical faith in God. It's a look at how vain and empty life is without a practical faith in God. Remember that in the ancient world there was no such thing as an atheist. So we're not talking about a, an atheistic perspective, but it's a person who really doesn't think God has anything to do with his world. What's that like? Well, a lot of people live like that, right, these days. Uh, and this man tried it for a while, at least in his life. And what is it like to live life totally under the sun, that is, without God, without the perspective of God? It is possible to have spirituality without faith. You know, you can be a spiritual person. Uh, from time to time, it's in vogue to be spiritual. Uh, but faith is a different thing. 
And that verse that closes the book, chapter 12, verse 13, is a call to a practical faith. Um, fear God, keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. That is not the perspective of the main uh, uh, main voice of the book, as you, as you see, as you read through it. And so um, it's sort of an illustration of what life is like, in essence, without God, without really believing in God and having a relationship with him. Another thing we might think about is how is what we find in Ecclesiastes true? How is it true? Well, it describes life under the sun, as we talked about. It says, so again, what does that mean? Under the sun means without God, okay? And it describes what that kind of existence is like. And basically, to sum it up, uh, it is that life is hard, then you die. Now that seems awfully hopeless to us, and, is, and it is. But that's how uh, Kohelet, the, the preacher, the teacher, the main voice of the book, that's how he's existing. Um, he, he over and over reflects, you know, life is tough, it's frustrating, uh, grab all the gusto while you can, enjoy it, because we're all going to the grave and we don't know anything beyond that is sort of his perspective life is hard then you die that's accurate that's true if you only have an under the sun per perspective and, um, and and we keep coming back to this but we really have to to come to the last words of the book where we are called beyond simply an under the sun perspective. We're called um, to, to living in God's world and in relationship with him. We're called to faith and practical faith. And so um, these are some ways that the book is true and the way we form some of the, the teachings from it. Another important thing to think about, I believe, is Ecclesiastes and idolatry. Um, you know, we hear a lot about idolatry in the Old Testament, a little bit in the New Testament. We know that it was common for people to believe in many gods in the ancient world and to worship idols. You remember this word that is so common throughout the book, um, Depending on your translation, it may, it may say vanity or empty or, or worthless. Um, that, that word empty or, or vain is actually a word that the prophets use many times. If you go later in the Old Testament and read the prophets, and we remember that the prophets are always preaching against idols, right? One of the things that they say about idols, one of the ways they describe idols is by saying that they are empty, that they're vain. So we can sort of link that here with um, this word in Ecclesiastes. And so Ecclesiastes has something to say about this idolatrous approach to life. And one person said that the human mind is, a, is an idol factory. It's constantly searching for created things to elevate to first importance in in their life. So you sort of see that, and we're all tempted to it, aren't we? Uh, to find something that we want to devote ourselves to um, and put first in our life, whether it's work or whatever it might be, and we sort of plan our life around those things, and we devote our energy to those things, and we even sacrifice other things to achieve them, that's the language of idolatry. Uh, the book of Ecclesiastes never uses the actual word idol, but it clearly presents the idea that, um, that there are a lot of things that can be idols. There are a lot of vain, empty, worthless things in this life that we live under the sun. And so it talks about things like wealth and power and status 
and uh, relationships even. It talks about pleasure. It even mentions wisdom in this vein. And the other, the other use of the word vein, um, wisdom, you know, he says, what good does it do to be wise? Why did I spend so much time being wise? Because in the end, someone else is going to come along and mess up everything I did. And it talks about religion being like this. Uh, yes, you can have religion without God. Uh, you can be spiritual without being faithful. So Ecclesiastes over and over goes through these various things in life that people tend to devote themselves to without a godly perspective and says that they're all empty, they're all vain. So Ecclesiastes and idolatry have a lot to do with one another, even though it doesn't use the specific word. One other thing is, um, I like to sort of compare books sometimes, especially when they're the same kind of books, wisdom books. So we've studied um, the book of Job together earlier on in our sessions. And now we've gone through Ecclesiastes a bit. And I'd like us to think about those together for a moment. Um, so remember what we, what we said about Job. As far as the way these books are put together, the structure of the books, um, in the middle part of both of the books, there's a lot to question, isn't there? Remember in the middle portion of Job, that's all those speeches by Job and his friends. They're trying to figure out why did these terrible things happen to Job. They're accusing Job of having unconfessed sins, you know, um, and, and Job saying, no, I didn't do anything to, that would have caused this. Remember that whole thing. Well, we have to keep that in mind as we read the middle section of Job. Uh, a lot of the things that the friends say are wrong. And God later passes judgment on what they say. That's a similar thing with the bulk of Ecclesiastes. Uh, there, there are things that we have to be careful about t pulling out and, and, and making it normative for life. We have to understand the perspective with which it was written. So uh, the, with both Job and Ecclesiastes, we're careful about what we read in the midst of the book. And with both books, the real truth comes at the end. Remember, at the end of Job, God shows up and he speaks for two or three chapters. And that's where we really figure out what's going on and what is true in the book of Job. Same with uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. We really get the main truth at the very end in the closing verses. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Uh, so they're similar in that way. And uh, really, when you read these books, both of them, they sound alike very often. Uh, both of them are asking questions about life. They're asking questions about God. Is God good? Is God just? That kind of thing is being discussed throughout. And so they're similar in that way. Uh, but they're different as well. So unlike in Job... Uh, the Ecclesiastes writer doesn't direct his questions to God in any uh, direct way. Remember, Job often speaks to God. God, I want my day in court. I want to argue my case before you. I want an answer for why these terrible things have happened to me. Co Kohelet, the, the preacher, the teacher of Ecclesiastes, doesn't do that. Uh, he doesn't. He has questions, but he doesn't ask God. Remember, he's living his life on the earthly plane, on earth, under the sun. And uh, Kohelet just sort of shouts his questions out to the void. Uh, and that's the way he speaks. And so we really rely on the second voice in Ecclesiastes. That is the narrator. We're just using that term for lack of any other. Uh, who speaks at the very beginning and the very end. We rely on what he says, the beginning and the end, to bring things to a good conclusion. So 
um, there's a little bit of difference in the way the questions are asked in, in these two books. Um, and remember one thing we talked about with Job. Um, you remember this idea of retribution. Retribution theology is the, the technical term for it, but it's what Job's friends uh, said about what was going on. Just to, to refresh our minds, what is that? Retribution theology is the idea that uh, God always blesses good people and always curses bad people. So if anything bad happens in your life, it's because of something you did wrong. And if you see a person who, who seems to be going along great, they must be righteous. And so when Job's friends saw all the awful things that happened to him, they, their theology, their way of thinking, forced them to conclude he had sinned and caused it. We see this in the New Testament uh, with the man that was born blind. And Jesus' disciples uh, came and asked Jesus, who sinned that this man was born blind, he or his parents? That's classic retribution theology. God always blesses the good and always punishes the wicked. Well, we know that that doesn't work 100% of the time. Um, the writer of Ecclesiastes sort of sought this kind of thing in his life, this way of making sense of things, but he was really disappointed. That's one of the things he discovered and why uh, it's good to read these books together. Over in chapter 7 of Ecclesiastes, verses 15 through 17 is the place where he really blows up this concept, um, uh, this very popular way of thinking about how God behaves. So Ecclesiastes 7.15, he says, In my vain life, that's how he begins. Imagine referring to your life that way. My vain life, my empty life. He says, I have seen everything. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness. That violates retribution theology, you see. The righteous aren't supposed to die, but he sees a guy who's righteous and dies, we assume relatively young. And then he goes on, he says, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. So he sees sinners, uh, he sees the unrighteous living a long life. Uh, that destroys the idea, you see, of, of retribution theology. So his conclusion, the Ecclesiastes writer, his conclusion, remember, because he's living life under the sun, he's living life without a practical faith in God, this is how he sums this up. He says, verse 16, Be not overly righteous, and do not make yourself too wise. Why shouldn't you destroy yourself? Be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? See, uh, he just sees all kinds of contradictions about the way he assumed life should be. And uh, it makes you wonder, you know, if, if Job and his friends and Kohelet, uh, the main voice of Ecclesiastes, could sit down in a room and discuss things. What an interesting discussion that would be. You know, um, they would have some things to say to one another and probably have an argument about some things. But these are just some sort of summary thoughts uh, from Ecclesiastes. I wanted, before we finish the book, to link a couple New Testament texts where we we see uh, the thought of Ecclesiastes expressed, but obviously taken out of the context of being under the sun. Because in the New Testament, almost always, it's talking about perspective of life in relationship with God. So, for example, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, there are a couple of verses there that, that um, this brings um, to the fore. Uh, Mark 8, let's begin at verse 34. 
Jesus, it says, he called the crowd to him with his disciples. He said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Now, the next two verses of what Jesus says sound like they could come out of Ecclesiastes. Because Jesus says, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? Uh, those two verses you could almost hear in the book of Ecclesiastes. But of course, it's, it's the Lord himself saying these things, and he's already couched it in terms of, If anyone would follow me, he'll deny himself, take up a cross and follow me. And, and I will give his life meaning. See, this isn't life under the sun. This is life under God, serving God. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? The, the one who wrote Ecclesiastes, whether it was Solomon or somebody else, um, at least for a long portion of their life, made all kinds of profit and wealth, and he was wise and all kinds of things, and yet he was really frustrated, unhappy, and frankly, lost. Uh, but, but Jesus, of course, gives all those things meaning. Another place where we can sort of see this idea is in James. I think we mentioned before that of all the books of the New Testament that sound like wisdom literature, uh, James would probably be number one. Uh, so it's not surprising that we would turn there. Uh, but there's this passage, I, I don't know about you all, but this is a passage I have heard quoted over and over and over by preachers, at least the ones I've heard as I've grown up and, and matured. Uh, but it's really the kind of thing that you might hear the writer of Ecclesiastes say. Uh, James 4.13, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such a, and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. You notice in verse 14, what is your life? For you are a mist. That ought to immediately make us think of the language of, of Ecclesiastes. Everything is vain, empty. Yeah. Here, the word is mist. Your life is a mist that sort of fades away, especially if you're just living life under the sun. And, of course, James is talking about a different kind of existence because um, he ties the Lord in in verse 15. If the, you know, instead of doing this, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will, we will live and do this or that. We don't just plan our life based on our own whims or whatever comes up during the day. We're actually living life under God. And so our plans always have this caveat, if the Lord wills. That's what we want to do. We want to do his will. So that's a, a, that's a place where we sort of get... Uh, the idea from Ecclesiastes, but it's uh, recontextualized, they would say, um, into a life under God. And one other place that's interesting to me is Romans chapter 8. And we'll finish with this one. Romans chapter 8 is the great Holy Spirit chapter of the Bible, of the New Testament. Um, the entire chapter is about the Holy Spirit and the work of the Spirit. And, and it's it just fascinating to me the way you wonder when Paul wrote it um, if he had some things from Ecclesiastes in mind. So in about the middle of the chapter, verse 18, Paul writes, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing 
with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Remember this part of chapter 8 of Romans where he's talking about suffering. And then he says, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility. There's the word that links us with Ecclesiastes. Futility. Think vanity, emptiness. In fact, the Greek word that's translated futility there is the very word that's used in the Greek New Testament, uh, in the Greek Old Testament, I'm sorry, to translate that word in Ecclesiastes. So it's echoing in the original language here. The creation was subjected to futility, vanity, emptiness, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Um, I mean, there's a lot of great teaching and, and theology there just in those verses of Romans 8, but I wanted to, to tie it to Ecclesiastes. So Paul uses this word that the, the, the writer of Ecclesiastes used. Remember how often everything is vain. Everything is empty. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Everything is vanity. And Paul says, yes, the creation was subjected to vanity, to futility. But guess what? It's being redeemed because of the work of Christ. It's being uh, made new by the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, it goes on and talks about how the Spirit helps us in our weakness. You know that text. But that is a, is a real tie between these two books. It just shows uh, how much the, uh, uh, the preacher, the teacher, Kohelet, the Ecclesiastes guy, whatever you want to call him, how much he was suffering by living life simply under the sun, on earth, without practical faith in God. And it didn't have to be that way, of course, a lot of these problems are solved with the coming of Christ and, and the truth of the gospel. And, uh, and this is uh, one of the great places where we see it in the New Testament. So I would challenge you to read uh, through Ecclesiastes sort of with some of these things in mind. Be careful when, when you study it, when you read it, when you apply it. Um, make sure we understand what's going on. But it is... A fascinating book because of its approach to things. This this guy on a quest for meaning in life, and he finds out that the way he's looking for it really doesn't yield much uh, because he's ruled God out of it, in essence. If this was Solomon, we know he had a period of his life that was exactly like that, uh, where he was away from God. We really don't know if his life ended that way or uh, if he repented and was restored to his relationship with God. Scripture is not clear about that. Uh, he started out well, but uh, worldly things really dominated his life for a long time. And I think that's what we see reflected in this wisdom book, the book of Ecclesiastes. So, next time... We're going to open up the last wisdom book, um, and uh, it's it's an, another interesting book, totally different. It is Song of Solomon. I don't know how much we'll talk about Sol Song of Solomon, but uh, we'll at least acknowledge it. Uh, there are other sections of the Old Testament that have wisdom literature. Uh, there are a lot of psalms that are wisdom psalms. For instance, Psalm 1, the very first psalm, is clearly a wisdom psalm. Uh, Blessed is the man who uh, walks not in the counsel of the wicked or sits in the seat of sinners uh, or stands in the way of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Go read Psalm 1, the one that introduces the Psalter, and you'll see a wisdom psalm. Uh, but um, the Song of Solomon is, is an entire book that is in this category, and it's totally different. And um, as I said with Ecclesiastes, I have a little bit different perspective on the book. I'm, not me alone. It's not. Uh, it's not. Uh, 
you know, just my view, but the Song of Solomon has been sadly misinterpreted for most of its history, probably because the, the interpreters were embarrassed by its content. I don't think we should be embarrassed by the content of any book of the Bible, but many were. And so weird interpretations of Song of Solomon have been offered. If you want to see evidence of that, some, if you have an old King James Version, um, one that has up in the, the top margin has little explanatory notes or tells you what the subject of this page is, see what some of the old King James notes are about what's going on in the text. You'll see a thing, a lot of notes that say this is talking about Christ, this is talking about the church, this is talking about Christ's love for the church, that kind of thing. Um, and, and we'll talk about that, the strange way Song of Solomon has been interpreted and what I think is the right way. Uh, interestingly, Song of Solomon has been very influential in its language, its poetry. Uh, it fills several of our older songs in our hymn books. If you've ever heard the phrase, his banner over us is love, that comes from Song of Solomon. Uh, the songwriter, the one who wrote that hymn that is in some of our books, uh, takes that and applies it to Jesus. Uh, but I don't think it was talking about Jesus originally. I'll, I'll spoil a bunch of your songs. I guess you're saying you're going to be mad at me if, if, you're, if you love some of those old songs. But I think it's important to, to understand or write the word of truth. Uh, so we'll open up the Song of Solomon and try and give you some good pointers on reading it. So I appreciate you sticking with this and plowing through Ecclesiastes with me. Hope you have a great uh, rest of your evening and and uh, and, uh, and that this is something that, that sort of builds up your faith. Uh, God bless you and may we live for him uh, full of faith this week. We'll see you soon.